Wow, that's hot. Okay. Uh, hi, everybody, and welcome. My name is Luke Allen. Uh, I am on one of the members of the planning committee, and I wanted to introduce you to some friends of mine who have been a source of inspiration and actually a, a source of uh, uh, knowledge as I've considered growing my family. And, and I thought, you know, it's great that we're coming together. We all share this bond of agriculture, and, but we're also people and families. And so I thought uh, there might be some interest from other people in hearing stories of those who have, have grown their own families. And so I would like to introduce some friends of mine. Uh, joining us at the conference here in person is Leon and Andrew, who live in California. And uh, we're going to hear about their story of surrogacy and starting their family through surrogacy. And I'll introduce my friends who are joining us from around the country. Uh, we'll start in the top left of our screens here. Roberto uh, is from Illinois, lives on, uh, outside of Chicago. And they are foster parents. He and his uh, husband are foster parents. Allison, hello. Allison uh, will be sharing her story of um, a couple that began dating and uh, a, a, a child came along with the process. So sort of quickly in, inheriting a child or bringing a child into the family. Uh, and Nick, hello. Nick will, be, Nick will be sharing his story of um, becoming an adoption, a family that's adopted children. So first of all, uh, let's start with Leon and Andrew. Tell us a little bit about your journey and the process that you went through in deciding how to go about starting your family and why you ultimately chose the way you did. He's, he's much more detailed than I am, so he's probably the better one to start here. <laughs> <laughs> Already. Uh, well, uh, <clears throat> I'll start just a tiny bit before what you said to set it up. Uh, Leon and I both uh, were in fairly um, demanding career-oriented uh, jobs, and we talked about, he talked about kids, actually, and I was more like I hadn't really thought a whole lot about having kids. And you said no. Okay, I said no. <laughs> and, well, I was, we, we, were, we were younger, you know, I didn't know if it was going to work out. Um, <laughs> just kidding. No, but uh, we, we were pretty, pretty plugged into jobs, and I couldn't, I, in my mind, I, my mom, I was, I'm one of five kids, my mom was home all through uh, growing up, and so my perspective of parenthood was that you need to be at home with your children and teach them firsthand what's, uh, what's acceptable, what's not socially, um, train them give them all kinds of support and opportunity and to see two parents go off to work every day that in my in my head that's just no, that doesn't work and so he talked about kids and I'm just like I don't see that as a possibility and uh, we had a pretty major change in in uh, our lives in 2012 and the I, shortly after the change uh, he brought up you know what do you think about kids I actually think I'm not sure even how it got brought up but it was near the end of the year and I was like, well, let's open a browser. Let's, what, what is surrogacy? What is adoption? Like, we started searching around. By and the way, this was after I manipulated two dogs into our life when he said, no dogs. So. <laughs> He's a strategist. <laughs> Absolutely. So I kind of had to prep the situation. Right? Okay. <laughs> yeah, I said no to dogs, too. Uh, anyway, so it was, it was December of 2012. I remember very distinctly. Um, the decision to, to do surrogacy came right around that time. And the best thing I can come up with, I think, is that it's a very personal, uh, very private uh, family decision that you have to decide for your family. And I, I believe that the folks would probably agree that each situation is, is extremely unique to you and uh, your support uh, and, and the opportunities that are available to your family. And so you have to decide what's right for you. For us, it was surrogacy. Um, it was, yeah, that was December of 2012. We met with three different surrogacy agencies uh, that helped facilitate the process, um, attorneys, um, the- 26 uh, contracts? 50, 55 signed contracts in the end. <laughs> Had a lot of contract reading, a lot of contract language. It, the, actually, the interesting part about that too is that it, the very distinctly uh, separate parts of preparing for organizing, I'm a project management mentality, 
And uh, so putting it all together, the pieces, I was like, I got this. This is, this is a lot of variables. I have a medical background, and so you know, learning about the medical aspects of it's all, all fit very neatly into uh, the steps and the processes and the coordination of all the resources. And all of a sudden, these live human beings are born one day and totally different. Nothing to do with the processes and the planning and the coordination, and everything's going every which way now. I've really enjoyed your journey following along with you as, as friends online. Um, and uh, Roberto, tell us a little bit about your journey um, that you and Jesse have experienced. Well, um, when I was 21, I came out and uh, I knew that not having a child was not part of it. I mean, I was not going to have a child. I was not going to get married. It was definitely not something that uh, was part of my plan. And then I met Jesse, and he ruined everything. Uh, he, uh, uh, with his proposal, uh, his marriage proposal, there was a caveat. He wanted children. So, of course, biologically, it's a little bit impossible. So, of course, we. Uh, seriously considered uh, the fostering experience. Uh, it was very interesting, interesting because once we made the decision as a couple, okay, it is time, let's do this. We reached out to, uh, here in Illinois, it's called DCFS, Department of Children and Family Services, to get a foster license. Uh, it, was, it was a no-brainer, it was like, okay, let's, let's just do it, let's just get on the ride and, and, uh, and enjoy ourselves. So we, um, we struggled a little bit at the beginning uh, going directly through the state agency. Um, there was a lot of red tape that we needed to go over. There were, someone came to do our first interview here at the home, you know, the, the home inspection, and they spent, instead of li listening to us, telling our story, they spent a couple of hours telling us how horrible fostering could be. Um, and honestly, it, it was not true. Well, moving on, there was this place called Lutheran Children and Family Services, um, and we were hesitant to go and try to get our foster license through them because, of course, Lutheran Children and Family Services, uh, we're all full of prejudices. Turns out it was the best decision we made. In two weeks, we were registered to go to our uh, foster parent training, um, right after we were done with foster parent training, we were already getting a foster child, um, and slowly we learned what foster parenting is all about. Uh, at this point, we have a foster child that we are going to adopt by the end of this year. We're really excited. Um, he's joining our family permanently. Um, one thing I have to say is that you will have a lot of plans. You will have a lot of things that you want to do. The house is going to look this way. The room is going to look this way. They're going to go to this school, and they're going to be awesome. Get that out of your mind immediately. <laughs> it, it doesn't happen that way. Uh, but it's Do fun. you see all the smiles it's on everybody's so faces? <laughs> all the parents were smiling, yeah. <laughs> Everyone. Yeah. It's truly fulfilling. It's a fantastic experience. It's exhausting at times. Uh, but you know what? Nobody comes with an instruction, an, an instruction manual when they're born. So you make it up as you, do, as you go. You listen to your uh, wiser friends uh, with their suggestions. Everybody has something to recommend. Everybody knows someone who knows someone who happened something. There's Facebook. You're not going to kill them. Trust me. They are uh, resilient, and uh, they just need uh, patience. They need a structured home. Structure is very important uh, for a child. And uh, just go with the flow. They, they need a lot of love. You have a lot of love to give, and they have a lot of love to give as well. Is the, the child that you have now the first foster child you've had, or have you had other children? I'm sorry, can you repeat your question again? Is the child that you have now your first foster child? No, he is our second foster child. The first foster child, we had him for about four months, and then they moved him to another placement. Um, Angel, who's our foster child, it was supposed to be an emergency placement. He had nowhere to go. He was actually staying at the 
First, he stayed in a hospital, and then he stayed in the actual office of the agency, of the uh, foster agency. Uh, they gave us a call. They said, we just need a, for him a place for him to stay. And uh, the first thing we always say, it, this is really important to us, before a child walks through that door, they need to know that they are coming into a same-sex uh, couple's home. There are two guys here. There are two dads here. And they need to understand the, the, what it entails because you don't want to say, okay, here you go, and they have no idea what they're, um, what they're going to have to deal with. Um, so Angel came into our lives, and the second we saw him, we knew it was going to be long-term. Uh, after a week of him being here, we contacted our licensing worker, and we said, um, we want to keep him. Slowly, we, the attachment becomes stronger and stronger, and we got to a point that we just went out and asked him, would you like to be adopted by us? And he was very nonchalant. He's like, sure, no problem. Like, no big deal. He's just, he was the 16-year-old at the time, so uh, <laughs> you know how they are. Um, and slowly, we solidified our relationship. We became a very strong family. We argue. We have uh, conflicts, and we have loving experiences. And he calls us um, J-Dad and R-Dad to different Jesse and Roberto. Each other. I feel like a bad rapper. Um, but it's just the most wonderful sound you will ever hear. Thank you for sharing. Allison, uh, would you mind sharing your story? Sure. Um, mine is unlike the ones you probably heard. Um, I've been with my partner for four years, and at the time that I met her, um, I knew she had a son, a 12-year-old son at the time, um, who's just about to turn 15 um, and going to be driving my vehicle. It's terrifying. <laughs> so um, I, it... In growing that family, I, I knew in the whole dating experience as a kid in the picture, and there's no how-to guide on how to date um, another woman alongside a kid. That's just, it's not a book that's written yet. Um, and so it was very challenging. It was challenging to, to think, am I, am I permanent? Am I temporary? Uh, what's my status? And so going into it, I had to go into it with a permanent um, look because I didn't want to just Ying Yang Jameson around um, and have him go through a lot of different um, partners. So uh, when we got engaged last year, um, he was involved with the proposal. Um, I had him help me pick out the ring. Um, I had him go along and surprise, we had actually bought a house the same day that I proposed, which I don't recommend to people, it's super <laughs> terrifying. Um, but, we had him hiding inside the house at the proposal. And so um, when she said yes, he was inside hearing the whole conversation, hearing um, the, you know, the, like the love between us, which was really um, cool and an awesome experience for him and for both of us. Um, and so it, we've always been really tight knit group. Um, I think what is challenging is um, I'm only 30 and he's 15. so. Uh, stepping in as like an insta parent is very challenging. Um, we're coming across a lot of hurdles in the high school. I teach in the same high school that he attends, which is as an agriculture teacher is a little terrifying because I come from a really conservative background. I have conservative students. Um, and what I found is that uh, he's in my room constantly like taking a football bag, grabbing his basketball bag, grabbing his lunch out of my refrigerator, eating my food. Um, and, the, and the kids totally embrace him. They're, they're totally cool with him being my stepson. They ask about him constantly. They ask about Teresa a lot. Um, and so the transition that I thought was going to be hard coming into my workplace has been actually really great for the relationships I can build with my students um, and the relationship I can build with him. Um, what I will say um, that Roberto was, uh, was, was saying is that uh, an instant parent is hard. Um, I thought I knew teenagers teaching teenagers, but teenagers at home is a totally different thing. Uh, I've recently had the experience of finding images on phones that I didn't want to see, and um, <laughs> learning how to address those things. And 
Uh, not having a, a male in the picture, and I would much rather just say, hey, Dave, can you have this conversation with Jameson? Because this is really uncomfortable. Uh, but it's, that's the challenge, is having two moms, and you have to talk about some things that are just not very comfortable. But he's like totally cool about it. Um, it wouldn't be this easy if he wasn't a really cool kid. Um, he's just super laid back. Um, and he makes parenting easy. Really the only hiccups we've had are those few, and then we'll find out next week when he starts to drive how that goes. <laughs> All right, thanks. Um, Nick. All right, um, so my husband and I, um, we met back in 2009. We got married in 2010, and uh, I had always been on the standpoint of I wasn't gonna have kids. Um, I come from a blended family where we're really spread out in age, and I have a much younger sister and brother that's 10 and 15 years younger, and so I knew that I was prone to possi possibly having that kind of offspring, and I didn't want any part of that. <laughs> um, but then as I met Randy, I changed my views, um, and we started the journey of adoption through foster care. Um, we were never foster parents, but we went through um, the system together. Now, when we originally started, uh, we weren't going to be allowed to adopt jointly. Um, one of us was going to have to adopt while the other one was just going to have to become a legal guardian. Um, but fortunately, um, there were some rulings that had happened in the court system down in Miami Dade area in Florida, which is where I live now, and uh, made it so that Randy and I could both jointly adopt um, our children. And so we had now have three. Um, we adopted our first son, David, at the age of seven in 2011, and he is now 13. We have another son, Frankie, that we adopted in 2013 when he was 11. He is now 15. So Allison, I get you on the driving. I'm going through it right now, and it is terrifying. Uh, and, then, um, and then our youngest, which we call our oops baby, because Randy and I have always been in the mindset of adopting the older children, because that's the, the real need in our in our uh, local area. And so we've always been looking at older children to adopt. And when we were considering adopting a third time, um, we weren't even finished with our home study when we got this random phone call um, about a nine month old baby. And uh, Randy and I really had to think about that because we knew that was gonna be um, quite different from what we were used to. We went in and spoke to them um, about this baby. Randy and I kind of decided well, if we're gonna do this, now's the time to do it because we're not getting any younger. And uh, once we got through that interview with about the nine month old, um, they came back to us and said, actually, there's this other child that we'd like to speak with you about. And it was about a two and a half year old boy. Um, now, when we, had our, when we adopted our second son, um, he had a lot of medical issues um, that required, required a lot of attention. And um, when we adopted Frankie, our second, um, that's when I stepped down from working and became a stay at home parent. Um, Randy had a job change and it made it easier for us to do that um, and honestly in our situation it was probably the best thing that we could have done for our boys. Um, it made it really easy for me to tackle all of Frankie's um, medical needs and issues that were going on and get everything sorted out. Um, he was actually in the system for 11 years, all 11 years that he was alive when he came to us um, and so there was a lot of holes and there was a lot of movement. I think he had over 40 placements um, when he was in care. So there was a lot to put together when he came to us. Um, so when they heard about our medical experience with Frankie, that's when they approached us about this two and a half year old little boy, Trent, um, who um, has a rare bleeding disorder. Uh, he has hemophilia B. So he has, um, which now we're on a new medication, so it's every other week um, infusions that I do intravenously here at home. Um, but it's easy, normal for him. It's it's normal life for him, so it's not a big deal. Um, I was at Nikki Phlebotomist when I was in college, so it was easy for me to slide into that role. So um, that's kind of, in a nutshell, how we came to being just Randy and I to us three. <laughs> and uh, we don't know if we will adopt again, but I never say never, so who knows. And Trent, their youngest, has the most adorable smile of any kid I've ever seen in the world. He is just the craziest little smile. You have adorable kids too, and all the kids are adorable. They're all, 
I am so inspired from all of their families. Like, like, and, and I really wanted them all to come and share with you. And I, I didn't, I, you know, I, um, I, I personally have, have reached out to several of them asking questions. Um, and, and so I wanted to share some of those questions with them. Um, first of all, what support networks have you developed to help yourself both in the research phase and now in the parenting phase? What, where did you go to find those answers when you started? And where do you go to find answers now? And it's open to anybody. Um, I guess I'll start. Um, I know when we started looking at adoption, um, the first thing we did was we found out what agencies were around us, uh, privately and public. Um, as we evaluated our ideas of what we thought we wanted to go, or what path we wanted to go, um, we went towards going through the foster system and we reached out to our local agency to figure out the process, if we were gonna be allowed to do it and all that. Um, they were able to give us a lot of information. And from there, as parents, um, I know where I live, I'm fortunate because we have a really strong adoption um, network in this area. Um, and so I am part of an adoption support group that we've been going to ever since we adopted our first. Um, we've been a part of that group now for almost six years. And uh, we meet monthly. And uh, it's just a great place for all of us to come together, talk about problems, vent, um, and get advice from each other, to pick each other up. Because um, when you adopt children from the foster system, um, you're not just adopting these children who came from you know, being removed from their parents. There's also this level of trauma that you're trying to um, help them heal from. And so you do get some pretty challenging behaviors sometimes. Uh, I know I have, I've had all the behaviors thrown at me. Um, I had one child that was um, very physical and uh, you know, I had been slapped, punched, kicked, hit, things thrown at. Um, I pulled off the road because I thought he was going to bust the windows out of my car. Um, but it was because he was so scared. It was because how far can I push this person before they quit like everybody else has. And so when you go through these things, you need to have people that can pick you up you know, when you're down and say, you know what, it's going to be OK. Just get up, breathe, tag out, which Randy and I are very good about doing, um, when, especially with my middle, who was our first. Um, he and I are so much alike, so we bump heads a lot. So um, I have to tag out a lot with him. <laughs> and next year should be interesting because I'm actually going to be teaching at this school. So um, pray for me. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's what we did. We, uh, we have support groups um, because they understand what we're going through. And so that's where, where I support now. And then from the beginning, it was always with the agency that we worked with. Um. For uh, no, no problem. Uh, for us, you know, we kind of were the first to do what we did. Uh, we didn't have any friends that, we, you know, we had a couple friends that uh, did adoption of, I think, uh, like a 13-year-old, and um, but we decided we wanted to have uh, our own biological children and have children from birth. Um, so the internet was really our beginning point, and. A lot of research done and flying all over the place to uh, meet with agencies and interview them and uh, finally come to a decision, uh, which we thought we chose one of the best agencies in the United States. Um, and it turned out to be kind of a, a mess. In the end, we have our children and they're amazing and we wouldn't change any of it, but uh, that's kind of where we started. And now we have a lot of friends that have kids and most of them are heterosexual couples. And so, you know, going to them for advice and whatnot, but every day is a new experience. <laughs> and like you said, uh, kids don't come with a manual. You figure it out every day. Uh, something different comes your way and, um, you know, you have to react to it to, for the best for your children and your family. When you talked about <clears throat> resources, uh, back when Leon and I were doing this in 2012, there wasn't really anything uh, comprehensive by any means uh, that to explain where to start, what's the next step, what's the plan. There's absolutely nothing out there, at least that I could find. And I did quite a bit of research. Um, and I, I like doing research. I like planning. I like getting everything set up and organized. 
um, and it just wasn't possible. Um, I've joked about writing a book uh, about it because there's so much to it, and that's just a whole other project to take on. Uh, since then, uh, one of the probably the best resources that I've found is uh, menhavingbabies.com. They have a website and they have a Facebook page, and they're a phenomenal resource when it comes to um, uh, a community of people who are either in the process, who have had children. I mean, their Facebook page, I swear, it's probably every month I see somebody else having a delivery, having you know a, a surrogacy arrangement uh, coming to, uh, to produce a child, or twins for that matter. Actually, lots of people have done twins now. So there are resources now, I feel like, that you can ask a few more questions, and if you're thinking about it, they really do have, you can throw a question on the board and somebody's going to answer in a way I try to pop on and answer as much as I can for anything that's pertinent to our situation. But there are people with every uh, situation out there, it seems like now, where you can ask a question and somebody will pop in, even if it's uh, not somebody with that experience, but a moderator or something who can kind of you know, give you a, the right place to go look. Uh, so there are resources. There are several others now, but the one that, that the one that I think that has the best is men having babies. Oh, and baby wise, and oh, toddler and baby wise. wise. If you're going to be a parent, I don't know about you guys, but uh, I'm sure that there are books that are farther along when they're they're older. But baby wise is the most amazing book in the world if you're going to have a child from birth. Uh, I'm I'm kind of well. You already explained my project management mentality and very methodical, very organized. Um, I have my challenge. Nazi. I have my challenges. We have uh, three kids in the house now. Um, <laughs> no, but seriously, when it comes to the structure, I heard somebody talk about structure. It really is about structure. Children, children need structure through and through. I mean, adults need structure. <laughs> but realistically, uh, Baby Wise is about structure. They were six weeks old when um, we came across somebody who pointed out the book, and I immediately started reading. I'm like, what is this sleeping through the night thing? Like, <laughs> let's talk more about that. And so reading the book, it was like, hey, it's a process. It's a, it's a structure. It's a schedule. And I was like, Leon, we're doing this. He's like, okay, what? And I'm like, I'm reading the book. And he's like, there was all this stuff. I'm like, Leon, I read the book. Did you read the book? <laughs> he's, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't necessarily understand what we were talking about. I'm like, this is what we're doing. This is the schedule. And it was like, a week, within a week, we were like super on schedule. We were sleeping six hours. The first night, we, 24 hours in, it was six hours of sleep, which was the first time we ever had that much sleep. First time we slept in the same bed in three months. Yeah, this was, <laughs> the, first, the first six weeks was, uh, we, we did shifts. Yeah. Uh, we did shifts, and so, you know, at 9 p.m., um, he would go to bed, and at midnight, um, we'd swap, and I'd go in the bedroom, close the door, turn on the noisemaker thing, you know, drown it out so that you could get three hours of sleep, and at 3 a.m., we'd switch again, and at, uh, yeah, no, I see Kirk's face. Yeah, absolutely. It was hell. It was hell. Like, I did 24-hour shifts as a paramedic for a long time, and this was 100 million times worse. <laughs> it was horrible. Way to talk us into this. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, that's why I say babywise. Babywise is the answer. It, it's structure. It's getting their feeding schedules, getting their awake time, everything set up. And if you follow the advice, I think it's chapter five, save yourself time if you don't want to read the rest of the stuff. But... <laughs> It, it, it drills down to how do you get them to sleep and how do you get them to be healthy, and it really does work. They've been sleeping 11 to 12 hours a night since they were 11 weeks old. So that's, I mean, it, it gives us the ability to watch TV at night and be with each other and do something that is not, uh, you know, crazy chaos toddlers. That's why we can sit on the stage together today. <laughs> that's Roberto, you, you were about to say something? Yeah. I, I, I'm going to echo your words. The structure is very important when you're raising a child. And it is not that you're going to be like this very... Uh-oh. Where's Tito? <laughs> Tito! <laughs> so, uh, since we apparently have lost, uh, lost the other crew uh, while we're waiting, what questions do you have for Leon and Andrew while we have them here and we have some time? What? Oh, this thing. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions from the audience? What's the process like of choosing a surrogate? Like the, the person, not the contracts, but like what did you guys interview? Yeah, so there, there actually, with surrogacy, there are four agencies that we worked with. There was the attorney group for um, uh, all the contracts. Most of this, the contracts for them are, are there are boilerplate contracts that they've created and they just change the variables for your situation. There's the, the group that finds the, <clears throat> the females who are interested in being surrogates. They do extensive vetting 
Um, and so there's this whole intake process is about at least four months. Once you meet the criteria, four months from then, then you might be able to be introduced to a family um, who's interested in, in, in doing surrogacy. There was the IVF clinic and um, <clears throat> the egg donor. We ended up tying those two together because lots of the IVF clinics have egg donor programs. Um, and then there was the counseling group who for us was, was uh, not really, uh, it was worthless. But um, when it came to, but our, our group that does the surrogacy uh, or finds the surrogates, um, they required counseling in this case. Anyway, uh, it's the, the intake process. It's not like online dating. So we create a profile, they create a profile. They introduce our profile to uh, the surrogates that, and, and there is a, a step before that I should say that the counselors meet with, eat, meet with the surrogates that come in that want to be surrogates and they meet with all the intended parents, uh, the IPs is what they call them. And so they, they do a profiling of you by just meeting you and, and learning about uh, how you think and what you're expecting and whatnot. And they use that to throw it all up on a board and go, okay, this girl might go with this IP uh, group. And so once they kind of figure that out, they say, they suggest to the um, surrogate, here's a, here's a couple, here's a profile. What do you think? You have two days to get back to us. So they read through and their profiles are quite extensive. Uh, they get back to you and say yes, then they do the same thing to us. Hey, this surrogate said she would work with you. Um, does this meet what you're looking for? Um, for us, it was Amy. Um, Amy lives in Santa Clara. And uh, it was the first one that they'd introduced us to. And we read through it and we're like, uh, they did a pretty good job. <laughs> she's, she's, her profile is somebody that would be perfect to work with. They ask you lots and lots of questions ahead of time. So realistically, it was, uh, do you want to be friends with a surrogate after, do you want this to be a business arrangement? Uh, do you want, uh, you know, any, any number of things, you know? And then they ask all the crazy questions independently. Uh, would you do a selective reduction? Would you do an abortion? Would you do amniocentesis? So they ask all these questions for, for the surrogate and they ask us about, you know, how would you go about this kind of thing? And then if you say everything's good at that point, let's meet. They sit, have a face-to-face -face -face meeting, and in this particular group had a, the counselor present who had met both of us independently, and uh, we sat there with Amy, her husband Jeff, uh, Leo, myself, and the counselor, and we asked all the same questions verbally in front of each other now. And now we have a verbal commitment seeing each other's faces and saying, yes, we're willing to do this, are you willing to do this, so forth. Um, and they suggest um, having some personal time after the meeting, and so we went to dinner that night. Uh, it was in Sonoma, and uh, it was fantastic. I mean, a Amy is just, She's our angel. Yeah. So, what are, what are the appropriate and the inappropriate questions to ask <laughs> results around surrogacy? Because, the, because I mean, I'm going, okay, uh, I would, there's a lot of questions I would love to ask, but we're talking about your genetics, we're talking about uh, a woman's body, we're talking about uh, money, all the things that we're not supposed to talk about <laughs> in, in, in good conversation. What is inappropriate? Um, <clears throat> realistically, I, I don't think there's any question that's inappropriate. It, it, it's, it's a very open uh, process. I mean, you, you go into it with uh, the objective of making a child or children, and, uh, and then that's, that's the focal point. And so from there, I, I don't know that there's any question that's inappropriate. Um, there, it, it's a very uh, intense and difficult uh, process all along the way, like many things you just described. Um, we had some major snafus with the, uh, I, I like to be organized, I like to know what to expect, I don't like surprises. Um, we had some major surprises, financial surprises that, uh, and, and I did the high-low budgets. <laughs> we were way over the high budget. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, there's things that you don't control. There were decisions that were made outside of contract that I didn't control. And so it got very uncomfortable very, very quickly. Um, lots of time talking to the attorneys. Uh, and so it's, 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 I don't know how to explain it. It's difficult, it's very difficult. And every question is out there and every, there are lots of them were asked of us. Um, we asked lots of them ourselves. Um, we asked lots of questions of Amy and uh, I mean, she's an amazing human being and there are plenty of, of girls who are just like her that are amazing, who are willing to, to be a part of something special like this. For Nick and Randy, the question was, what are the appropriate and inappropriate questions uh, to ask and, and conversations to have as it relates to, to growing your family. You know, um, do, do either of you have anything you'd like to share? Maybe they, I don't know if they can hear us or not. Can Maybe. you guys hear? 
Nick and Roberto can. I don't think so. Maybe not. Oh, there we go. Can you guys hear yeah. us now? Okay, so the, the question that we were just discussing was, what are the appropriate and inappropriate questions to ask uh, it, as you go through the, the foster, the adoption process? Are there inappropriate questions? Yes, no. Well, if I may, the one of, like I said, one of the big things that we, uh, we told the, uh, our licensing worker is that any child that, anytime you recommend us to, you know, a foster child that needs to, needs a foster home, they need to know that they're going to a same-sex couple's home and what that entails. Because in a child's mind, it's like, all yeah, right, two guys, but they need to understand what it really means. Um, so don't feel bad about it because if a child comes in and they don't know that you're in a same-sex same -sex relationship, they may sabotage the foster uh, home, and they may try to get kicked out, and they were go are going to test you even more. If they don't want to be there, they don't want to be there. Um, another thing, you need to protect uh, yourselves. Um, this is something that, I, I, at the beginning, Jesse said it, and I felt a little bit uncomfortable because you really want to be available for all kids, but. For example, if a child has had a history of sexual abuse, especially by men in our case, um, that's unfortunately, it's a red flag. I mean, a reality is that in this day and age, we all walk with a big bullet, uh, what do they call it, target you know, on our backs already. Um, so unfortunately, yeah, that is something that you, I mean, maybe you are ready to work with something like that, but there might be implications. Uh, you may find children that know the system, they know how to play the system, they know all the rules, they know exactly how much money they're supposed to be getting every single week, they know how to, mani how to manipulate and how to play the game, and they know how to lie. So you need to be careful about those things. Remember, you, you want to help them, of course, but there are others out there that also need the help, and if they, let's say all of a sudden you get a call in the middle of the night, or a knock on the door from CPS and they are asking to remove the children because there's an investigation uh, against you. You just raise your hands, not a problem, let them go out um, and uh, eventually it's gonna be cleared out, but you know how it is. You have to be very, very careful. And, and again, try to weigh in what is what risks you're willing to take, how far you want to go, and, uh, and then go on. Again, there are plenty of children out there that will fit whatever, uh, whatever requirements you may have. It is, it is really sad, it is really unfortunate, but it's a reality. Great advice. Allison, the, the, the question was, uh, what are the appropriate and inappropriate questions uh, or conversations that that we should that 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 are allowable or or not allowable. Well, I'll tell you some uncomfortable ones that we've had as parents um, from people, um, and and we come we're just now starting to have these really uncomfortable conversations with either Jameson or just with just people who don't even see uh, same-sex couples as an option in our community. Um, there's a group of us that meet every Friday. We call it Wine Friday. Um, and we, we drink wine and we wine. Uh, and we talk about conversations. Uh, I was working a snack booth, a perk of being a parent of an athlete. And um, one of the parents who was working with us me and Teresa were both working in there, had said, um, like, oh, who are you? Teresa says, oh, I'm Jameson's mom. And then she turns to me awkwardly, and I saw this coming from a mile away. She's like, oh, who are you? I'm Jameson's mom. And she, like, looked left, looked right. <laughs> and, like, for, like, 30 seconds, it was the most awkward pause. And it turned beet red. It was more awkward for me than probably for her. And I said, yeah, he has two moms. And then it was just, like, it was just insert foot and mouth, it was awful. And we come across that more often than, than anything. Um, we get people that ask, 
So is he adopted? Is who who is it? Is he? And then it just there's questions like that that come up that you have to answer, and I'm not prepared to answer yet. We just um, we we lived in a community before where everyone knew, and now we're in a new community, and everyone wants to know. And so the way that they ask is sometimes really inappropriate. Um, they assume that he's adopted because he is mixed. He's half black. Um, he looks like Teresa, I guess, but doesn't look really anything like either one of us. So people assume that he's adopted, um, which is also a challenge too. They don't assume that um, he shares any genetic makeup of either one of us. Um, so we get um, those questions a lot. People want to ask if we're going to have more kids, which I can find asking, but then their instant question is, well, how does that work? I don't really want to tell you how that works. I don't, I don't care to. Yeah. Um, but we get weird questions like that, uh, and I'm okay talking about them with my close friends, which is why we have that fine on Fridays, um, because we come up with those questions um, all the time. And there's about four same-sex lesbian couples that we meet um, just to talk about it. And I was surprised that there was even four sets of us in Sherwood, but um, we found each other. and. We talk about those conversations that are really awkward and, and hard. Um, the most recent one, too, people ask, um, I'm getting married in two weeks. Teresa and I are hyphenating our, our last names, and they ask, are you gonna adopt Jameson? And um, the answer is yes, but then you ask Jameson, and he doesn't wanna change his last name. So we get people who always ask how that works. Um, do I convince him to change his last name? Do, do I leave it? Because I haven't been in his life for the majority of it. So that you just have a little bit less ownership when you're a step parent. Um, so you get harder conversations like that that start to happen. I do want to uh, add. <clears throat> Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say on, on, on the questions, um, I don't really feel like there's any bad question to ask. Um, uh, I feel like if you have that question, you need to ask it um, when you're going through any kind of agency. Um, because obviously, if you're asking that question, that's probably not the first time they've heard that question, too. So um, if you have the question, ask it. No such thing as a bad question. Um, but also, when you're going through um, foster system and through adoption, um, my biggest thing for that process is just um, and I don't know how it runs across all the different states, but I know with here in Florida, we have child studies. So it's a, it's a document that's um, gonna tell you the story of that child since, since that child entered care. Um, sometimes they're very detailed, sometimes they're not. It depends on the caseworker, depends on how many times that kid has been around the system. Um, but really go through those documents with a fine tooth comb. Um, and you wanna ask all those questions that you can because once you finalize that adoption, that file is closed forever. So you want to get all the information you can before you finalize an adoption. So for those that don't know, uh, Lena and Cade are genetically um, half siblings. They're, uh, each one of them has genetics from Leon and myself, and then they have the same egg donor female, and then carried with a third party surrogate. Um, a pretty intense you know, setup. One of the questions we get is, are they identical? I'm like, well, one's a boy and one's a girl, so. <laughs> But the other question that is probably actually, maybe you made me think about it, this is the one question that we pretty much have refused to answer. Um, and it's, uh, well, whose is whose? And so it goes back to the, in the clinic, the day we transferred embryos and Amy's on the table and they pull the little screen and so she's there, but you don't see the actual process. Jeff's in the room with us, her husband. There's our, our nurse, Adriana, who's fantastic, and our doctor, Dr. Evan Rosenbluth down in uh, San Ramon. And there's six of us in the room. And so we don't know what's gonna happen. They're telling us as of last year, you transfer two, two will take. You know, we don't do three or whatever else, which is brand new at the time, like just, you know, within a year of, of doing this. And so we transfer two, not knowing, are we actually gonna get two? There's an 80 something percent chance. And so at that moment, we looked at each other and we're like, this is, this is personal at this point now. The ones we chose out of, the, we had five embryos to pick from. Um, they're rated with uh, like the eggs you buy in the store with grades. So one was a grade AA and one was a grade BB. Super interesting. Um, and they transfer those two and we know about it, but then somebody finds out and they say, well, whose is whose? Well, we, we didn't know if both were gonna take. 
Um, we didn't know what the next year was going to look like or two years. And here we are at two years and it's, we don't want anybody to ever look at them as, oh, that's your child or oh, that's, they're our children. And so it's, it's an awkward question. And so, especially because it's like, well, we never told anybody, not even our family, the six people in that room know. I'm sure at some point it's going to be obvious, but when, when do you, when is the right time to, to break the, the silence on it? I don't know. It's an awkward question. People say it's obvious all the time, but then the people wrong. get it wrong <laughs> all the time. Well, and the, the and crazy, it's a game. The crazy part is we picked a egg donor that had both of our ethnic backgrounds as a nice hybrid to us, so and it's the same genetics from her. So, For each of you, uh, you you've obviously all, all been through a lot and learned a lot. Uh, what do you wish you had known when you started? Or I, or I guess another way to say that is, what advice would you give each of us? Uh, what, what's the one thing that you didn't find in the book, even though there wasn't a book when some of you started? What do you wish you had, had learned in the beginning? I mean, for... Um, one, sorry. Go ahead. Well, you know what? Don't be afraid to say no. In the case of foster kids, um, if they call you and say, hey, I have this kid who's wonderful, like you guys said, you go through every single one, ask all the questions you can ask, and if you think this child is not gonna be a good fit for your home, don't feel bad if you have to say no. It's, it's gonna be good in the long run for the kid. Uh, you know your home, you know what you can and cannot do. I mean, if you do not know how to handle a child with ADHD, and don't get a child with ADHD. I mean, it, it is, it's, it's really a, uh, a challenge. Um, I'm a teacher, so to me it's a basically meat and potatoes, but not everybody can handle something like that. So don't be afraid to say that. Um, <clears throat> I think what I would say is, um, so Randy and I, we actually, um, we come in and speak to all of the um, new parents who are wanting to adopt. So we come in and speak every month to the new class um, for our local agency. And we just kind of share our story because we did adopt in county and out of county. We've adopted older and younger. Uh, we've adopted children that were from sibling groups and children that weren't from sibling groups. Um, all of our children are different races. Uh, we have a, um, our youngest is African American mixed, our oldest is Hispanic, and our middle is you know, he's just white as you can get. So um, we're all mixed. So <clears throat> I would say the biggest question that I feel like we get asked a lot is one of them is financial. People, for some reason, feel like they have to be like in the best financial position before they can have children. And let me just tell you this, you're never gonna be in that spot. So <laughs> um, yeah, people just make it happen. And that's just what you have to do. Don't put that as a factor. I mean, obviously you wanna be able to be the child. But, um, you know, you're never going to be in that position that you think you need to be in before you have a child. So um, I would say just don't worry about that part. Um, another thing is um, at least coming in from, uh, you know, adopting through foster care, I would say the biggest thing that I like to tell people is don't try to erase their past. Um, so many people think they're doing the right thing by trying to erase their past, you know, and obviously you want to because it's and you don't want them to have pain. But they need to understand and process and move beyond that in a healthy way, and you can't do it if you just shut it out. That's one of the biggest things I would say is to, once you get to that point, is to really learn about that past, figure out how you can help them through it in a healthy way so they don't turn to unhealthy ways to process through it. Um. I don't know what I could share from my perspective other than um, Teresa and I didn't have conversations, uh, some like those deeper conversations until probably about two years of dating, which like, again, the stereotypical like lesbian couple, we probably should have been there at like three months, but um, <laughs> like we, we were like way late bloomers, it's fine. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say my number one advice for people is to Talk with your partner about some of those things because what we're finding now is, um, and part of it is, is me not believing in PDA in public. How out do you want to be in your community? 
Um, and, and when you have a student who is a high schooler who's easily embarrassed in front of his peers, it becomes pretty challenging to walk into a football game holding hands walking up the stairs to the rest of the community. Um, it's a challenge to show any affection at a basketball game uh, when your son's a star of the team and everyone's looking at you because you're a transfer. Um, there's just a lot of things about being a couple in a small town community um, with a, a pretty successful son. Um, it's, we didn't really talk about how out we want to be. Um, we know that people are accepting. We know that people um, have come to us and said, thank you for you know, sharing your story with us. Um, but it is still a little nerve wracking, not, not wanting to kind of crush Jameson and his you know, ego a little bit. You have to be a little bit more conscientious, I think, at being in my building. Um, we also didn't really talk about uh, future kids as much as we should have. So what we're finding now is that uh, we wanna have, obviously have a child before Jameson graduates so that he can be a part of their life. Um, and we think that's very important. What he thinks is really important is that that kid looks exactly like him. So uh, his thought is, and he asked me about a month ago, he's like, so how does this sperm donor thing work? I guess we're gonna go there. Um, and so we talk about <laughs> how to pick out sperm, how the process works. Um, he asked, this was the most awkward part, he asked about turkey basting. And um, it was just like, just this really eye-opening, he, he knew about the whole process. Uh, he had obviously done some Googling before he had the conversation with me. And I'll tell you, Teresa's never in the room when this stuff happens, ever. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's always when like I'm, a ho I'm home alone with him, I just know something bad's gonna happen. But we didn't talk about what race our future child would be. Um, so his opinion is he, will, he wants the kid to have a really good role model, and a good role model looks exactly like you. So we have to have conversations about a family, and it doesn't matter what you look like. Um, he just wants them to be a big basketball star. So he assumes that then we have to have a mixed race Child. So that was the difficult conversation the last couple of months. Um, and we didn't really talk about um, like the parenting philosophy as much. We're kind of winging it right now. Um, I'm realizing I'm a bad cop, she's a good cop. Um, and I get the awkward conversations about uh, which girl he wants to ask out and how. Um, and she really gets more of like school stuff. Um, and all of that. What I also realize is that teachers in my building will come say, um, Jameson's doing really well in this, but he's kind of a turd here. And I just say, I don't, I don't want to hear stuff about him. Tell Teresa, I don't, I don't want to be in the middle of that conversation. So there's just some things that I couldn't expect to happen. So I guess do a little bit more forethought and planning, especially if you have other children that are in the mix, um, so that you can not be caught off guard by some of those things. Just think of every possible thing that could be a hiccup in, the, in a relationship because it puts a strain for sure on our relationship, um, just parenting and the stress of that. So we have about one minute left. Would so I actually personally struggle with this question. The question was, if there's something you could go back and do differently, what would you do differently? I struggle with that because that means that there's some dissatisfaction with where we're at right now. To me, for me, that's what that means. And so. Uh, I, I don't believe there's any dissatisfaction or anything that isn't more beautiful than what it actually is. And so I am thoroughly uh, satisfied and happy and, and uh, I enjoy every aspect of it. So to look back and think about doing something differently, I, I wouldn't. Well, no, uh, it, it's <laughs> what do you wish you would have known? What, mm, but again, like I, ended up, I feel like I knew what I needed to know okay. at the right times. Okay, excellent. All right, well, uh, we're out of time. I have a lot more questions, but I'll save those for later. So thank you, everybody. Uh, I appreciate uh, each of you sharing your stories, and, and I hope that this has been helpful for the audience. It, it was helpful for me, so thank you.